You're listening to Power Athlete Radio, a podcast dedicated to empowering your performance every damn day. Join former NFL pro and Power Athlete founder John Wellborn as he dissects the greatest minds in strength, conditioning, and more. Joining him is everyone's favorite coach and hair model, Chris, a.k.a. Tex McQuilkin, Power Athlete's Director of Performance. So whether your goal is to be the hammer, destroy mediocrity, or simply move the dirt, you've come to the right place. Now with the warm-up done, let the gains begin. This episode is part of our Move the Dirt series, designed to empower you with the tools to move towards your goals. Move the Dirt is something we say a lot here at Power Athlete. The dirt is the dirt. It's that lazy, fearful, bitch mode voice in your head that says too tired, too busy, too old, too injured, too whatever. You can't reason with it, but you can move it. Some days you get a big ass shovel in your hands and it's easy. You're strong, you're motivated, you're king of the world. But some days you get a spoon and you still got to show up and move that shit anyway. Rep by rep, spoon by spoon. So long as you're moving a little dirt every day, you're digging in the right direction. If you're sick of the dirt dominating you and you want to be master of your own self, walk the Power Athlete path with us. Visit powerathletehq.com forward slash training and start moving the dirt today. Welcome to another episode of Power Athlete Radio. Actually, not just another episode, one of my favorites. Of the year? Of the year, because (laughs) I get a chance to talk to my good friend, longtime friend, mentor, and just kindred spirit, Rob Wolf. Yes, and we get to a lot of fun topics today, including longevity, fasting, sodium, and why, I guess, big, was it big salt? Who's out, who's going after salt? Um, cardiovascular disease health. Um, okay. I have always linked salt as a major player in cardiovascular disease. Um, I've known Rob for many, many years. Probably one of the bigger reasons that CrossFit football existed and by de facto power athlete and a lot of what you see within Power Athlete with the nutrition stems from much of my interaction with Rob. I've not only counted him as a good friend, an ally, uh, a brother, but just one of the best people I've met in my life in terms of honesty and just being able to explain it better than anybody else. There's a reason he's a two-time you know, New York Times bestselling author mm-hmm. and one of the sharpest dudes in the field. And a documentarian, Sacred Cow. Yeah which we do not explore, but we have a hell of a lot more topics that we get into. It's awesome. Yeah. He, unlo- he unpacks a lot for us today. Now, Rob dies on a lot of hills and is able to get into fasting and cardiovascular disease and sodium and really just staying in good shape, making sure you're carrying a ton of muscle, lowering your body fat, uh, doing a bunch of training that involves a little bit of hypertrophy, as he calls it, um, max motor unit recruitment, power, and living a good life. And moving some dirt, right? Moving some dirt. Ready, ready. I'm excited. Dive on in. Here's the data. 80% of nutrition resolutions fail after just one month. What we help make happen is you moving the dirt past February 1st. So here's the deal. If you want to attack the year with purpose, stay the course and hit your goals, you need Power Athlete Programming. It's been battle-tested at the highest level and gets results for every level of athlete. As a special offer this January, if you commit to the cause for a year, you get the full Power Athlete experience for less than a dollar a day with an extra 200 bucks of content for free, a one-on-one consultation to help you set your goals, and a nutrition protocol of your choice. Visit powerathletehq.com forward slash training and start moving the dirt today. Mr. Wolf, great to see you. Great to see you guys. I wish I was in person. Ah, uh, dude. Someday. Anytime. Anytime in person. Uh, it's always great to see you, dude. So how's, how's everything going? Everything's good. Everything's good. We're uh, getting some serious snow this year. Like Montana is not farting around this this go around. So it, it's been cold. It's been snowy. Hopefully it chases some of the riffraff out of here. So it, it, it's pretty awesome. Yeah. So a bunch of the California transplants are like, oh, this place isn't that bad. And then all of a sudden you get like four months of negative 40 and like 12 feet of snow. And you're like, yeah, those people are going to go running for the hills. Yeah, well, we see them spun out in the ditch all the time. So just because they have a giant four by four and everything, uh, like every person I've helped pull out of out of the ditch, I'm like, so where are you from? They're like uh, San Diego, Los Angeles, <laughs> San Francisco. I'm like, you have a nice truck, but it's not magic. Like friction is in physics are still a thing. You got to slow the fuck down. 
Yeah, uh, yeah, no, uh, wheel speed and all that. But I mean, same thing happened here in Texas. We had like 70 days over 100 plus degrees. And I think people just like started heading back. Yeah, yeah. That'll tend to wilt people. So, um, dude, anything new? Anything on the horizon? Anything we need to be abreast of? Because Tex just dropped an atom bomb on me. And I don't know, just for reference, I'll set the stage. 2009, Black Box Happens. Rob Wolf, John Wellborn, Oakland, California, get up to do a nutrition seminar talk. And McQuilkin. Yeah, and it was right around this time of year. Yeah. Yes. McQuilkin was sitting in the audience. It's, it's today. So it's, this is December 8th, the recording. I know we're releasing this 2023 to kick off the new year. Happy New Year, Rob. But this is actually, ironically, or serendipitously, the yeah. anniversary of me meeting you guys. Oh, crazy. Yeah. Crazy. So he actually brought his notes from our talk and has been grilling me on them. And unfortunately, we've given hundreds of seminars, so I can't really remember exactly what we talked about, but he was going to refresh our memory and more importantly, see if we've deviated or changed, which of course we've evolved. But realistically, uh, I don't know if we're as passionate about some of the things or maybe we've you know slid on some of these things that we thought were more important. But for the most part, like it has, as he's reading it to me, I'm like, no, it really hasn't changed. My approach to this whole thing is still pretty, pretty dead on. Yeah. I mean, I guess I've, I've gotten to a point, I, I guess one thing that has shifted is I'm much more respectful of individual differences. And so like, if I'm, I'm tinkering with somebody, um, and something's not working or it's not working quite the way that, uh, you know, we might like then I'm much more quick to, uh, shift gears and and try something different, like on the strength and conditioning side, like becoming a little bit more aware of, uh, you know, if you are not super fast twitch oriented, maybe a, a little bit more in that hypertrophy rep range is is ultimately gonna gonna you know benefit the individual versus uh, somebody who's who's you know that um, what type two two B X you know, fiber just fuck. They seem to thrive at like ones, threes and fives and get huge and strong and, and everything. Um, uh, you know, nutritionally, uh, I still think some sort of a minimally processed whole food diet with it, you know, and then being aware of, do you do well, more fat fueled? Do you do better, a little more carb fueled? Are you a little bit more zone, you know, mixed, mixed fuel ratio? I, I think I'm a little faster to go, to that now, you know, to it, to at least, um, acknowledge that, but you know, the, the, uh, either survivorship bias or, you know, just the crowd that I, I started attracting to myself. Um, we were only open as a gym for two years before men's health recognized us as one of the top 30 gyms in America, because we, we had people flying from all over the world to work with us because, because of nutrition because of metabolic and autoimmune issues, you know, so like we weren't necessarily like a remotely a West side barbell or like a power athlete affiliate where we're just making big, strong, jacked people. But, um, fuck man, we help people with some really complex health issues. We got plugged into the local medical scene. So we had a doctor that was really on board with the, this evolutionary biology approach. And we had folks with these com really complex health issues that we were really able to help. And so I still think that that kind of paleo diet evolutionary biology template, it, if somebody's crushing the world, great, keep crushing the world. But if you, if you're like where I was 23 years ago, where it, you know, I'm 165 pounds right now, I was, I was 125, 130 pounds. So my ulcerative colitis almost killed me. I'm not a big guy. And if you imagine 30 pounds less of me, like I was nearly dead and we had a lot of folks like that. And so this, um, this ancestral health template, I, I still think is like the best thing going as like, if we're going to throw a dart at a board and just start, God damn, that's a good spot to start. Uh, then I we need to you. not be religiously dogmatic, you know, to, to iterate off of there because somebody might have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. We're able to get on top of that. And then maybe they're able to have a much broader diet and they can, they can ramp up to more training and stuff. And I, I think that for a while, a, a good chunk of time, like, because I had so much success with this kind of autoimmune paleo approach, I assumed that everybody needed to be on there. And John and I have talked about this. Yeah. Like I, I ground some people down to a, a burning stump, you know, where, where they're trying to do MMA 
CrossFit football and, and I'm giving them like, you know, 20 grams of carbs a day. And it's like, nah, it's not going to work. So, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, I still try to revisit Art Devaney's evolutionary fitness and that of those original works. I mean, I, I look at it today and it's as important today as it was back then. And it really hasn't changed. And if anything, um, you know, the worst thing, and we've talked about this for years, uh, the worst thing that happened to the paleo diet was all the paleo weirdos started showing up in loincloths and, you know, more reminiscent of the liver king than anything. And all of a sudden the weirdness kind of overshadowed realistically how you should be eating and still how I eat most, you know, I'd say 90% of my diet is still wrapped around that. And uh, you know, the original kind of tenets, you know, to quote our liver King buddy, but what Art Devaney talked about and really what, you know, when I first met you, what we talked about still makes a ton of sense. Um, I always go back to, you called me on the phone after hanging out, I think it was in New York city with Art Devaney and you referred to him as Superman's grandfather. And he was like super fed and moved well. And you said he stepped off the curb and ran across the street and like super agile. That always goes into my mind in terms of like whenever we get into this stuff, I'm like, what's the, what's the template that allows me to be successful, not today, but for 10, 20, 30 years. And it looks like having a big, broad aerobic base, um, you know, some zone two stuff, you know, lifting some weights. So now you're talking about max motor unit recruitment, you know, mitochondrial density with that aerobic stuff, you know, learning new skills, learning new games, continue to, you know, verify it and, uh, you know, get outside, move, eat real foods, you know, base it around protein, you know, uh, maybe have 10%, don't be weird. And for the most part, like, you know, try to keep everything in check, make sure your hormone levels are there and that anything that becomes a problem you deal with instead of just putting your head in the sand. And, uh, like, as I kind of revisited that stuff for, for this, I was like, dude, it still makes a ton of sense. And I'm always amazed when people rail against it. Yeah. The, the against it is, is funny. And maybe we'll dig into that a, a little bit, but the, um, the 10% don't be weird is kind of the rub, I think, for us. Because you guys have had great success. I've had decent success. But let's be honest. If we had figured out some sort of a shtick like Liver King, we'd, we'd be 10x what we're at, 100x what we're at as far as reach, revenue, all, all the rest of that stuff. I think that that, that approach also has a really short life cycle at, yeah. at, as a tendency. Um but it it's funny. And, and some of this is just like human nature. Some of it is the algorithms that reward ridiculous bullshit. And, and so because we do the the bulk of our, our outreach on, on social, like if you do something ridiculous, um, it, you know, you get rewarded for it. So that, that is always, um, kind of a, a, a burr under my saddle that it's kind of like, well, you know, if you decide to head down that way, but I kind of feel like it's really burning the boats. Like you're never going to come back to a, a credible spot. Like, um, you and I in, in some amazing alternate universe, like Ken Ford actually thinks you and I are like legit credible people, <laughs> yeah. which is fucking ama amazing to me, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But, I'm, I'm with and, you. I'm and like, really? I, I, I appreciate that. And I value that more than a 10 X on my, my revenue and my, my reach, you know, like the respect of people like Ken Ford and, and, uh, just my peers like you guys, like that actually really matters to me. So I really want to help people. I want to be innovative and everything, but I, I also just refuse to go full retard on this thing and just go like, you know, to, to the ridiculous places that people take this stuff and, you, you know, circling back around to the liver King thing, 95% of what that guy's talking about is just bang on. Like it's great stuff. And, and even, even if he had just been straightforward, he's like, yeah, man, I'm, I'm supplementing here a little bit. I'm just enjoying life. Like take a little bit of a Mark Bell angle on this thing. It's like, mm -hmm. I'm just, you know, I'm optimizing left, right, and center. And and he could have had a 10th wing of uh smart pharmaceuticals or something like that. And he would have been good. You yeah. know, you would have been both honest and, and good on that. And I think that it, it would have uh, uh, ensured a much longer life cycle as a, a, entity on the interwebs but he chose not to do that and it's very odd uh i am more amazed that people thought that he was natural i thought it was a spoof i mean uh, and even to the point where mark bell who's you know probably fucking eons uh passed us with that stuff i mean mark bell went out there and came back and he's like i think he's natural which either means that 
Mark is uh, like not very intelligent or maybe, I don't know, we handed him a big pile of cash. It's like, keep my secret. Yeah. Like we're dicks. And so, <laughs> you know, it marks, Mark's like, ah, you know, he pro- probably was super friendly and nice to him. He's like, oh, okay. I'm, I'm sure he's telling me the, the truth. Mark's just a, a genuinely nice guy. Uh, yeah. But just looking at the liver King, I mean, the entire thing is so, I, I just assumed he was playing a part and this was part of the part. And I mean, good for him, but I'm just amazed that people are like, I felt wronged. I'm like, did you really buy into this? And um, people did, which I just mean means that either we don't know the market as well, or people are really gullible. They're actually believing what they see on the internet is real. Which is the, the latter, unfortunately. I mean, the last couple of years with, you know, health insanity and whatnot, like people have um, abdicated all rational thought around things and and people are really you know like the mass formation psychosis stuff like people mm-hmm. really want something to believe in they they want to believe in something bigger and greater and and all that stuff and that's a whole I- interesting thing um folks do need heroes they do need folks to look up to and but it's uh i'm really uncomfortable with how to approach that like i i i try to be a good role model and a good example, but I actually like pull that stuff back a, a fair amount because um, I've had a fair number of my mentors end up being narcissists and borderline personalities. And um, I was voted most likely to be a cult leader in high school. And I've <laughs> got those tendencies, you know? Yeah. I mean, Texas it's like manifest destiny. It's like, look at CrossFit and paleo. <laughs> yeah. Dude, have you been watching the secret? The tip of the spear, Rob's like right there. Like, it's like when they show like the assassination of like Kennedy and they show like, you know, uh, the Bay of Pigs and they start showing all these like historical pictures. Yeah. Yeah. Of everything. They like to circle Rob Wolf. He's like, he's everywhere. <laughs> and uh, it's true. I mean, within the CrossFit stuff, I mean, we've always, uh, I loved Rob's comment that if we could have just figured out how to work a vegan diet into CrossFit and then been able to sell that without I guess, well, we would have had to abandon our souls. We probably destroying people <laughs> be like, Hey, if you're a vegan CrossFitter, you're at the top of the food chain. And then we just would have been like a rump, a rump, a rump. You just need a wig and a soul patch. Have you seen Garth Brooks's alter ego? Yeah. Uh, Chris Gaines. Yeah. You just need <sighs> Rob Gaines. Uh, there's, oh, there's always a weird piece. And I know this has happened to Rob because it's happened to me where all of a sudden the devil calls and makes, wants you to make a deal. And it usually involves stabbing your friends in the back for some form of monetary gain or something that, you know, they've presented to you. And this has happened to me on numerous occasions. And I've opted to not make the deal with the devil. And it's probably hurt us financially or, you know, or let's say reach wise. Uh, but I've always said at the end of the day, like, I want to be able to look myself in the mirror and realize that my friends are my friends for a reason and the people that I support and that there is a certain code of ethics that I've subscribed to that I haven't just poured acid on and shitted it down because, you know, there was some opportunity to make an extra dollar. Like, I mean, like, like even talk about the liver King, I mean, to take on this comedy role and almost be play the buffoon, uh, like the way I view it, but yet other people didn't view it. They, they viewed him as like this, polarizing hero, somebody to kind of model themselves after where I thought the entire thing was ridiculous. The guy's like, I haven't wiped my ass in two years. I don't brush my teeth. I mean, he's like making all these preposterous claims where I'm like, this is fucking disgusting. Uh, He's convincing people to eat like pounds of raw testicles. I mean, like all of this stuff and people are like, yes. And I'm like, you have to be fucking kidding me. I mean, there's that, that moment where the devil comes and makes you a deal and you know what you do? You fucking say no you know what, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing and I want to be able to wake myself up in the day and like look myself in the mirror and feel good about it and have people around me that actually know that, you know, when shit gets bad, I'm not going to stab them in the back. So man on a mission, Rob, you're on a mission with the healthy rebellion. So with the new year, do you see a, a growth opportunity? What are some of the, the battles that people are bringing to you that you help empower them with information to, to go to battle with their peers? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's interesting with the healthy rebellion. We spun that up uh, uh, several years ago now after like I woke up one day and I I'm not super like check my metrics on my websites and everything like all the time, but maybe once a week I'll, I'll check in, but it just happened that I had checked metrics. Um, 
maybe like three days before. And then I got up this one day and just kind of looked at like site traffic and it had fallen off a cliff. I mean, it, it was like 97% down. I was like, holy shit, like what's going on here? And poking around, poking around, poking around. And then I got a, a ping from Chris Cresser and Mark Sis, and they're like, hey, did you guys notice that like we've been basically removed from the interwebs? And and it turned out that Google had done this thing called the OWL update, which Google has long been in this, this game of trying to curate and own health and, and medicine. And there's it, it, none of this 100% made sense to me, ironically, until COVID and like these novel vaccines and all this stuff. But it, it was about six years ago. I forget which direction the money went, but like it was like a $600 million transfer between GlaxoSmithKline and Google. And the, again, I'm not sure who who did which direction. But Forbes made this case that Google should really be looked at as a, a pharmaceutical company, you know, in, in addition to the other stuff it's got going on. So I basically woke up this day and and uh, myself and a number of other people um, who are kind of in this lower carb ancestral health space were on this naughty list where Google had historically rewarded one for original content and creating link backs from notable websites. And, you you know, it was uh, kind of a meritocracy, like, you know, and I had, I had a very um, high traffic website and a, a pretty good presence. And then it was gone. It was literally 97% of the traffic disappeared because uh, the hundreds of articles that I had written over the years no longer ranked, you know, they were, they were just, just gone where somebody might have once been looking for, low carb diet for type one diabetes, where they might once have found my website. Now they would find a WebMD site saying that uh, low carb diets for type one diabetes are incredibly dangerous. And for the love of God, don't, don't do that. So I had to make a decision about what I would do with this. You know, do I just roll over and die? Um, I do, we had similar problems uh, on on Facebook because we had this keto masterclass, and there was a a period of time there where if you spend a certain amount of money selling some some product like uh, the keto masterclass, you could make some money off of it, and it just became this thing where if we spent a dollar, we made a dollar, but we could never we could never make the thing profitable, and we actually reached out to the literally the bestest largest uh, uh, Facebook uh, sales agency in the world. Like, oh, we could we could sell this keto masterclass all day long. And they got in and started fiddling with it. And it was about two weeks later, the guy was like, dude, you're being shadow banned. Like you, we we can't, we can't sell this thing. Like it's an awesome product, but there's no way for us to sell it. So I had been completely cock blocked in my ability to reach anyone, you know, who hadn't already heard about me. And so we were trying to decide what we would do in response to that. And I just wanted to get out of the social media ecosystem, the Google ecosystem to the best I could, but still be able to help people. And this is where we we spun up this uh, healthy rebellion community. I mean, it's not dissimilar to you guys being on Train Heroic and that you've got this separate place where you you can be and folks can interact and you can kind of control the, the messaging and the inter- interaction and everything. And it, it was really good. And the timing, it was genius around, we, we launched maybe eight months before COVID hit. And then when COVID hit, people needed a safe harbor to just be able to ask questions, you know, and, yeah. and it was interesting. We had to spin up a, a, some rules of engagement around how we interact with each other in this, this place, but it was basically no question off limits. But the answers needed to be respectful. The interaction needed to be respectful. It's interesting when you when you have folks spending 20, 30 bucks a month to 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 be there, they're generally not dicks. Like they're kind of invested in yeah. what what they're doing, you know, it cuts out a lot of the riffraff. And I I I think it saved a, a several lives just from like people killing themselves. Like there were folks that that were basically said that uh I don't know if I would have gone on if I hadn't had somewhere to just get a reality check because like work, family, media, social media, everything was this, this very monochromatic communication coming at them that, it, you know, they needed to be scared. They needed to be terrified. They needed a mask. They needed to be quintuple vaccinated. It doesn't matter what your health status is. Like it's a one size fits all approach. And if you don't buy into all of it and support all of it, then you are a grandma killer and a horrible human being, you know? So it was good with that. And it, it but this last year, 
I, I've just been looking at my time that I have to to just foster things, you know. And I I, I have kids similar to uh, age to John, um, two girls, eight and ten, and they're at this this spot. We're homeschooling. We started homeschooling a little bit before COVID, and have just kept doing that. And that there's an age now where the the time that I spend with them now is going to be critical for the rest of their lives, like possibly the most most important time that I ever spend with them in their lives. And I look at the the work that I do for Element and then some of the other um, kind of like advisory obligations that I have. And I looked at the Healthy Rebellion and it's super important, but I also didn't have the time to put into it what is necessary to, to charge people for it. So what we ended up doing... And I haven't I haven't mentioned this anywhere, so this can be news to most people who aren't in the rebellion. I basically made it a free entity, but we closed it. So everybody that's in there are the folks that have been there from the beginning, and we put a bubble around it. So it still goes. We still have good stuff going on. We we do resets. We we have great uh, interaction and commentary. A lot of people get together in real life, like they actually do trips. We had people travel to Spain to visit you know, rebels in Spain and all this stuff. And we're going to try to do some more in real life uh, events this year. But a uh, text you asked, like, is that thing going to grow? That thing's not going to grow, but for a purpose, like it's got about 1100 people in it. And that's a beautiful size for a, a vibrant small town, you know, where everybody yeah. gets along, everybody communicates really well. There's always awesome discussions and, and interaction without too much tomfoolery on it. And so we, uh, you know, I made this, this tough decision because it made money. It, it was, uh, you know, this thing that we, we built up from, from scratch, but I, I just looked at my own life and where I can, um, put time and resources into things. And I'm not as tough as John. Like I never see John not stick another thing on his plate, but he's way fucking harder to kill. Than I uh, Rob, I am, I do. I'm, I think this, that was youth and hubris because I like Rado, I like during Thanksgiving, uh, I was telling Chris this, I woke up at like three in the morning with like a chest, like cavity, like could like tightness being like, I have too much going on. Like I got to thin the herd. And I think that unfortunately we get to a point where, you know, you only have so much bandwidth to do something well. And you get to a point where you're doing like a whole bunch of things and you're not really being able to sink as much time to really be good at it. And then you sit back and you're like, man, like, how do I want this thing to go? Uh, do I want to be mediocre or kind of average at a lot of things and kind of spread your time? So no, I'm in the, I, I think there was just an idea in the beginning that, you know, Hey, I got strong shoulders. I'll just keep fucking heaping it on. And then you get to a point where you're like, I just don't know if I could do all of this. So I think you got there a little bit sooner than me. And then the other thing that, uh, has thrown Chris and I for a little bit of a loop. Uh, you know, we got approached by Shandi Ribirio to train those guys for, uh, from Six Blades for the uh, No Gi Worlds, which is happening this weekend with Victor Hugo and the, and the team. So then all of a sudden training those guys three days a week, bringing on young 20 something athletes that need more than just training, but it's, uh, you know, making sure they get to the chiropractor and all the other pieces and helping them with their diet and monitoring this. And then also so going Turning up. pro as an athlete. Because the you know the the mindset of a, of an NFL athlete, and then the BJJ professional, worlds apart. Yeah. So helping them grow up a little bit. Well, you know. but but also talking to them about what it means to be a professional athlete and not putting things off and helping them manage it. Um, but yeah, it was like diet, helping them with their training, and what was really eye opening to us. Uh, when they when they showed up to train, I mean, these guys are two time world champs and these you know black belts and they uh, you know go and they're you know top guys in the world. But then realizing that when it comes to the training space, they are one hundred percent amateur beginner white belts. Uh, putting them into just a basic linear progression where you know all of a sudden eight weeks later, if they put eighty pounds on their squat, uh, you know they went from being able to do this. I mean, seeing these beginner gains and realizing they haven't even scratched the surface. And then also like stupid stuff like, hey, make sure you're going to the chiropractor. What are you doing for your recovery in this? So we unfortunately um, took on this new project. And then also for me, you know, I thought it was disingenuous that they would come train with us that I wouldn't go learn what they're doing. So then also pulling myself out a couple of days a week to go train with them and go learn this stuff, which is, has been extremely gratifying for me to learn a new skill. But also it's another time investment 
And, you know, and then you also get to the point where I don't want to suck at anything. So then you got to put enough time into it. So you're not just showing up to fucking get choked out. Uh, So it's uh, like we added something to the plate that we didn't necessarily have time for. But But it it is charging because we're introducing these dudes to the barbell for the first time. And think about all the success in life you had, Rob, with with the gym. And even now when people start training and the confidence that they gain yeah, in their bodies, in themselves, and they start to, you know, flex in front of each other and, uh, you know, be proud of their bodies versus covering it up and hiding it. And while they were so gifted athletically, their GPP, their their foundational movements, yeah. they were garbage. And now they're not. And yeah. it's, it's cool to see that. And then just being able to, you know, see the talent in which they were moving and then, you know, to check in with their coach. And, you know, my, my deal with those guys every week is like, are they improving? Do you notice improvement within their their jits games and their ground games? And the one I would love to to hear some of that that insight. Like, uh, what has their coach reported? I suspect I know, but it'd be fascinating to to you know what's their coach saying? You know, taking these guys that were top of the food chain already, but novices at strength and conditioning, and and maybe not super well versed in in sound nutrition. Like it sounded like you you related one guy which is just interesting. They're in weight class sports. So you want to be mindful of, of food intake, but you nearly doubled the guy's food intake. Uh, he, he gained seven pounds of muscle. So he came in, he was about 250, eating about 2,100 calories, about 160 to 100, maybe 135, 160 grams of protein. I put him on classic Mauro de Pasquale anabolic diet. Uh, kept him, you know, basically at somewhere around, you know, 25 to 50 grams of carbs for about three weeks. Um, you know, got him up to 250 grams of protein, you know, figured him out to fat at about 41, 4,200, which was still a little low, but I don't, I also didn't want to kill him. And it was amazing when all of a sudden we dropped him low carb, uh, his performance went up. Uh, he started putting on muscle. He felt better. Any of the gut issues he had just completely dissipated. So he was on that for three weeks. We finally gave him a carb refeed, you know, let him just eat as much rice and basically put him on the diet that we've been using for many years, paleo diet. And it was amazing to see not only the inflammation, the body fat, everything changed. He doubles his calories, only gained seven pounds, but I guarantee he remodeled at least 15 pounds of body fat uh, into muscle. So completely different, Um, you know, probably 80 pounds on his squat in the last eight weeks. So every workout, they come in three days a week, we were adding between five and 10 pounds every time they came in. Uh, you know, pull-ups, I mean, deadlifted PRs. I mean, everything was so good. But what was amazing was we doubled his food intake. All of a sudden now he's able to train three times a day at a much higher level, sleeping better, and has dropped his body fat and only gained about maybe seven pounds on the scale. Which, I mean, in a a, a weight class sport and, um, you know, grappling is so attribute-driven um, you, you know, because you've got this person across from you that at the highest level, the skill sets are probably going to be really similar and the, the, uh, ability to suffer is probably going to be really similar or they're not going to be there. Mm-hmm. So then it's kind of like, okay, what type of strength, power, stamina, you know, broad aerobic capacity are, are we bringing to the game and like how confident are folks in that they're like, man, I feel like I can fucking walk through a wall. And so what's that going to do for like their, their head space going into this thing versus being like super depleted, but uh, 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 bumping up against overreaching over training every day, all the time, every training session being a complete grind because you're under fueled and, and, uh, you know, you've got some, uh, nagging systemic inflammatory, you know, injuries because maybe you've got some, some dietary issues in there and maybe just overuse patterns and whatnot that are never getting addressed from a, a proper S and C program. Like, man, what a, what a transformation for that. And uh, jujitsu, um, the only thing I can think of that is, is more stone age than a uh, jujitsu is like a PBR professional bull riding. Oh. Um, those guys are just beginning to, to think about some nutrition and strength and conditioning. And, uh, the same company that owns the UFC bought the PBR and, and funny enough element, we ended up buying a, a bull, like we're going to have a bull in the PBR circuit and we're starting That's to, awesome. to work with some dudes doing that stuff. It's pretty, pretty legit, but, um, you know, these guys are used to sleeping in their cars at the events and stuff like that. And it's like, no, we're going to, we're going to start 
thinking about this like like you're an athlete and we're going to tackle this like you're an athlete well the there there's a few things that were really like stood out to us um you know putting a bunch of focused trunk work in and not just like you know curls but being able to hold different isometric contractions different planes of motion whether it be transverse frontal or sagittal um really developing them focusing on that position you know that good hollowed out pull your top ab down squeezing the glutes teaching them that good position uh that was fundamental because now all of a sudden um you know no more back injuries and a lot of things that might have been naggy whether it be neck all of a sudden those things subsided uh the other big one was actually focusing everything within like a rdl making it very glute focused because a lot of the guys when we looked at them were real flat on the ass and real lacking in hamstring strength and, you know, there's this idea where they're constantly forward, you know, bending the knees, kind of coming forward. So teaching them a good position um, for the BJJ guys that are in the gi, it's a little different. Now they're kind of going into no gi, which is more wrestling based. So now toes forward, knees over the instrument, a lot more strikes. So actually the power athlete squat that we teach, you know, toes forward, knees over the in t- um, knees over the insteps and like kind of that universal athletic position. Uh, as we're teaching them to load in that position, whether it's squat or trap bar, jump, I mean, everything goes back to that. And then having them go and like, oh, we just went to wrestling practice and that stance that we were working on in the squat, that's the exact stance they were trying to get me in when I wrestle that I didn't understand because they're in this constant jujitsu, open feet, kind of duck footed, knees forward, chest up. And that was like a huge one where they were like, we've been fighting to try to get these guys in this position. And now all of a sudden they just know the position. And I'm like, well, yeah, it's everything we reinforce, you know, whether it be swinging a kettlebell or everything goes back to this position. So that was real important. Um, The other big one was, (laughs) you're going to love this, putting an actual conditioning portion into their training, Uh, you know, and we've been using the echo bikes. So we've been doing a bunch of different Tabata protocols and helping them big build capacity because it's all concentric. And then allowing, you know, that gas exchange and really allowing them to have big capacity to the point where now they go out and they, I don't gas, you know, because, you know, that's a big deal. You got a 15, 20 minute deal. So they're kind of, you know, playing guard and they're kind of, you know, going back and forth. And then all of a sudden, you know, they, they hear the, you know, the tap and they know they got a minute or two left. And then they try to hammer it down because, you know, nobody wants to gas. So having the capacity and the confidence to just fucking go hard and be able to push this motherfucker and try to just grind people into the earth. Um, and you know, that confidence associated with it. So fixing any lingering issues, making sure they're strong and stable. And the one, um, comment that Shandi actually made to me, which I thought was pretty amazing. He goes, when you guys started training, I was nervous that they would lose mobility due to excess muscle or they would put on size too fast. He goes, it appears that they're actually more mobile in their hips and stronger in these end ranges than I've ever seen them. So it looks like their mobility's increased better than we could have ever hoped. And I was like, that's pretty good. Yeah, so, I mean, it's it's been a fun project just because it's um, different. I got a question for you. So we took over their nutrition, and much like people out there that make dramatic changes to what they're eating and shift towards more of this paleolithic diet, what goes on in the body? Like, what can people expect to feel and then what goes on in their body? How long should the, the you know, the, the energy change? Like, what, what's going to happen if people make this dramatic shift, especially as we get into New Year and people want change? Can they expect to happen by dropping all that crap and start eating right? You know, it, it, it's funny, and I so wish 20 years ago um, – the electrolyte story was more front and center. And clearly this is like very self-serving for the dude that has an electrolyte company, but we give away our formula of how to make it. So if people don't want to buy element, they can go to drinkelement.com forward slash homebrew and make their own. Like we tell you how to, how to make this stuff, but it, it's just, um, usually when people do a dramatic change in their diet, it, and this is whether it's paleo or vegan or anything, if you're going from a highly refined diet to a minimally processed diet, your glycemic load is going to drop, your insulin load is going to decrease, and you're going to tend to shed a lot of sodium and water. This can make you feel awful. And this is like doubly, triply compounded because 85% of the sodium that people consume is from processed food. So if you stop eating processed food, 
you're going to stop consuming the bulk of the sodium that you eat. And then you're, you're also in a state where you're retaining less of the sodium. So people can expect to feel kind of garbagey unless they are really on point with electrolytes. And this is one of those, those things that like, I think the keto flu or, or, you know, and, and keto flu doesn't just apply to, to eating a very low carbohydrate diet. People report this, even if they're, they're doing like a whole food vegan diet, you know, because the, the glycemic load changes so much that they're diuresing, they're shedding water, they're shedding sodium. And if they will drink something like pickle juice or element or, or like do a couple of bouillon cubes a day or something like that, it's a night and day difference. And they just don't end up hitting that wall. There's usually a, a good 21 to 30 day period in which like anaerobic capacity is very uh, oftentimes comp compromised because uh, uh, the, the, the kind of fat mobilization hasn't been tapped into. But even then, like so much of the energy needs that are, are deficient with dietary change, if folks just stay on point with electrolytes, like it, it's a it's a much easier transition, a much less gnarly transition. And, you know, change is tough, whether we start doing a new training program or um, dietary shifts or what have you. And, it, you know, in online marketing, every time there's another click within an online marketing funnel, you can expect a 50% drop off in the number of people that make it to, to finally like a, a purchase. And I see a huge analogy there with just kind of diet and lifestyle change. Every click, every hurdle that somebody faces, there's like a 50% attrition potentially there. And so if you're already facing the challenge of like, I don't totally know how to cook this way. I don't totally know how to eat this way. My family doesn't support me. I get my balls busted at work because I'm eating better. Like there's all these like challenges that are happening and you throw on top of that, that you feel like abject garbage. It's a tough sell like that. That's really hard. So again, I know it's kind of self-serving because of the, the proximity to element, but if and when people decide to get in and do some change, particularly around diet and, and exercise, if you will invest in your electrolyte status and, and specifically sodium, because I'm assuming that folks are shifting towards a minimally processed whole food diet, whether it's high carb or low carb, you're going to get a lot of magnesium. You're going to get a lot of potassium from that. We might need to augment that a little bit, but the, the thing that will be lacking in that scenario, because we're not eating processed foods is sodium. And the thing that we lose during training is sodium. The thing that we lose uh, from from heat and humidity is sodium. So that really ends up being the thing that we need to address. And when people get on point with that, it's just so much easier. And so it's another one of these, these things that would spin folks out that I think that we can make that go away. So at least amidst all the other challenges, they're not also just feeling like garbage in, in the process of change. I did not know that. In our, in our notes from the seminar way back, the big battle was cholesterol. I'm curious, when did sodium, you know, it's always been an enemy. When did you start to have the, the light bulbs go off for oh, sure. protecting and valuing sodium? Well, I mean, there's probably two things that the medical community has firmly placed their foot or their foot, like the, the boot on their neck is the high, you know, cholesterol associated with dietary cholesterol and saturated fat, heart disease. I mean, that paradox and then also the high sodium being associated with, you know, heart attacks and, and dysfunction, you know, within the, within, you know, within the body. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, sodium is a, so cardiovascular disease is the number one shortener of life in the world. Uh, somewhere around 2007, nobody's sure about the exact date, but more people began dying from chronic degenerative disease than from infectious disease and like malnutrition. It's the first time in human history that this has happened. And a huge slice of that chronic degenerative disease is cardiovascular disease. And a major vector in the cardiovascular disease is hypertension. It's high blood pressure. Sodium is absolutely a player in that story. But the, the thing is, is it, so uh, when the body retains excess sodium, we retain excess fluid. If we have too much fluid, our blood pressure is too high. Every time the heart beats, it damages the kidneys, it damages the eyes, it damages the brain. Like it's literally like this, 
this just beating the person down with hi- hypertension. It really is um, uh, a remarkably injurious condition to have. And so the medical community is rightly concerned, you know, a- about the the hypertensive state. The bastard, though, is that they looked at it with first order principles and not, you you know, a, a systems based approach. Because they they did their diligence and they found a linkage to sodium and hypertension. But then when they put folks on low sodium diets, the blood pressure doesn't really go down. It goes down a little bit. And, and similarly, if somebody is high, uh, insulin resistant, and particularly if they have a certain set of, of genetic risk factors, if they consume a high sodium meal, the blood pressure can go up a lot. It will then go down over time as the kidneys kind of get get on top of that. But the thing is, is that the driver of that process is insulin resistance. It, it, it's this metabolic dysfunction. When insulin is elevated chronically, then we elevate other hormones like aldosterone, like cortisol, like epinephrine, which are all stress hormones. One, like we don't sleep as well. And when we don't sleep well, then we get more metabolically broken. And it's just a, you know, dar- gnarly downward spiral. But what it really causes us to do is retain excess sodium. And we bank sodium in our tissues, we bank it in our bones. So if you put folks on a low sodium diet, particularly a chronically low sodium diet, their their plasma levels of sodium don't really go down that much. And their blood pressure doesn't really decrease that much because we're just mining sodium out of the bones and out of the tissues. And over the course of time, what, what we end up with is a shockingly high linkage between osteoporosis and low sodium intake. In concomitants with high blood pressure. And also interestingly, when you're pulling all this calcium out of the bones, because the the body is trying to to access sodium, you also have all this calcium available that is beautifully situated to calcify the plaques and our arteries Mm -hmm. further, you know, exacerbating this, this goddamn uh, uh, cardiovascular disease disaster. So, and this stuff is really crystal clear in the literature. This is not like you know, made up the very evidence-based, but we, we just won't or can't get out in front of this and acknowledge that metabolic derangement insulin resistance is likely the primary driver of this hypertensive state. And really no, nothing illustrates this better than, uh, the kind of the flip side of this. It is a guarantee that you will drop people's blood pressure If you fast them or put them on a low carb diet, there's this process called the diuresis of fasting in which insulin levels drop, aldosterone levels drop, and then we will start shedding water and sodium like crazy. And it can be really uh, problematic for for folks if if they don't get on top of it. But this is, it's not a maybe thing. It is a guaranteed thing. Like if you want to drop somebody's blood pressure, this is a, a use case for doing some amount of intermittent fasting. But if we just drop glycemic load, if we just lift weights, if we just uh, do some sort of zone two cardio, if we make people metabolically healthy, they will get to a normotensive position. Once people are metabolically healthy, then they're, they're arguably their sodium need increases because their body isn't tending to retain sodium so aggressively. And when they're metabolically healthy, they're usually exercising and they're probably eating better. And when they're eating better, they're just, you know, again, um, so few of, of these minimally processed foods just come with a, a giant bolus of salt. It, it, it is worth mentioning, though, that traditional cuisines, whether it's Italian like antipasta plate or Japanese foods like uh, miso or, or um, you know, like the, the uh, chutneys and stuff like that in Indian food are usually these side dishes that are very, very sodium dense. So the main courses are usually not super high sodium, but most traditional cuisines have these high sodium uh, accompaniments that people will kind of pepper in as as uh, a flavor enhancer. But also it, it, it's because people need some amount of sodium in that, that mix. But this is kind of the big picture reason why sodium has had this, this um, cross, you know, it's in the, the middle of these crosshairs because cardiovascular disease is a huge deal. It kills a lot of people. It shortens a lot of lives. It costs us a lot of money. Uh, hypertension is absolutely a primary driver of that. Sodium is a piece of that story, but it's a bystander. It's not 
in my opinion, and I, I, I think it's very easy to defend this, it's not the driver. It's not the the causative agent. The causative agent is excess calories, excess refined carbohydrates, insulin resistance, which then causes us to, to retain the sodium. So it, it's a fair amount to unpack. Mm -hmm. Um, you, you know, but, but the, the easy thing, particularly if you're dealing with like an athletic population, if somebody's feeling kind of garbagey, if they're not getting a pump when they do training, um, if they get any type of like lightheadedness, if they go from seated to standing, man, you give it, you're like, dude, grab some pickle juice and do six ounces yep. of pickle juice. And then you come back 20 minutes later, 10 minutes later, if you need electrolytes, you feel like you just had like a double espresso. And it, it, that's a whole thing that's that's worth mentioning. Caffeine, although wonderful, doesn't give us energy. It blocks our ability to sense adenine in the brain. And so it's really just blocking our sense of fatigue accumulating molecules. Um, but the thing that actually drives energy production in the body are sodium potassium pump. So when you put the salt in the coffee, that's how it all works. Rob, uh, well... Like, this is just something observationally, you know, from going and, and doing JITS, um, you know, because I take Jamie up to do a class and then I'll do like a, a whatever, like the beginner kind of fundamentals class. The one thing that's pretty amazing, and I talk to these guys at nauseum, everybody about it, um, if this is the only thing you're doing, and they're doing more than other people because they're showing up, but it's amazing, especially for the guys and most of the people, uh, the amount of injuries that they kind of uh, deal with and I always talk to him like oh you know what's going on oh I hurt this and this and my first question is like how's your sleeping like are you doing any extra training do you do any weight training and like it's always no no I you know this the fundamental understanding of like you said like having a big aerobic base so you can sleep better and you can recover and you create this durability through lifting weights so then you can go out and you know eating well and what we're talking about here in terms of the sodium fits into this whole paradigm of durability and the biggest one I get to is, you know, fat's extremely oxidative. If you carry too much body fat, you're basically putting yourself, you know, you're, you're digging yourself a, a hole with hormones and recovery and all the other stuff. If you can just get your body fat down to a manageable amount, create a little bit of, you know, zone two, a little bit of conditioning, lift a little bit of weights, all of this stuff isn't going to be as detrimental as what you're finding. I mean, you come and you roll for, you know, we were did like what, like three, six minute um, rounds last night. And like, you know, the guy I'm going with is like, dude, like my elbows, I'm having all these problems. And I'm like, dude, I'm not even going hard. Like my deal now is uh, I like whoever I'm rolling against, I let them get me in the worst position. I'm like, give me your best position. And I let them kind of battle me and get me into their worst. And I'm like, okay, is this your best one? And then I fight my way out of it because it's the only way I'm going to get better. But what's amazing is just the lack of durability within training partners. Because like guy will show up like, oh, I'm hurt here or this and this. I'm like, dude. Why are you guys coming apart at the stitches? Like this is this shouldn't be the case. And then the minute you want to start talking about diet or training outside and this, like oh, I don't have time for all that stuff. And I'm like, I wouldn't show up here to purposely put myself into a crucible to get hurt unless I had shored up all this other shit around me. And it just reminds me of like the general population. And this is even a higher point because people are actually showing up to class to actually do something physical. But much like working with the jujitsu players, like realizing like we get stuck in these bubbles where we have these you know, esoteric conversations with our amazing friends and then realizing that there's still people out there that believe adding extra salt on your food is going to somehow lead you to a quick, uh, quick grave or, you know, eating red meat with, you know, I mean, this cholesterol, saturated fat, all this other stuff. And then realizing like, holy shit, like this stuff has been not only curb stomp, but disproven for so many years but yet the mainstream media, that's where people are getting most of their information. And the doctors are extremely uneducated and not very sophisticated in any of this stuff. And they're just perpetuating bad information. It's a bona fide shit show. Like you really, um, you're on your own with this stuff. And this is again, where it's important to have community. You know, that I think that this is why you guys have had the great reach and, and like the folks that have been with y'all, they've been there forever, you know, and there's not like a big revolving door. Like when somebody sticks with you, they're like, oh yeah, this is my tribe. These these are my people, you know. And you get this sounding board, and you, you know, a a hat tip to to Greg Glassman is this thing of uh, let's make it like the Gracie Challenge. Let's make it pretty transparent. And it, it, you know, if you look, feel, and perform better, if your biomarkers of health and disease improve, then we're on to something good, regardless of what like the Game Changers movie says or this thing or that thing. You know, it's it's like. If you're uh, 
look, feel, perform better, got some good biomarkers generally going in favorable directions. Like we're, we're on a good tack there and it's very defensible. It is not a randomized control trial, but clinical medicine, clinical intervention is where most of the world happens. And, and, you know, something that the evidence-based people need to be reminded of, we got this bell curve when we do a study and they average all of the results. Well, if you happen to be 100% in the middle of that, then this stuff maybe applies to you wonderfully. And drug drug trials are a, a great example of this. But if you're a couple of standard deviations outside the norm, maybe it works exceptionally well for you, or maybe this intervention kills you. But the average tells us absolutely nothing about mm-hmm. that. And that's where the individualization is, is critical. And, and by and large, Everybody benefits from some basic mobility work, some basic improvements in uh, dietary composition, a little bit of circadian entrainment, getting outside. Um, John, you gave a hat tip to uh, Art Devaney. I mean, his like uh, uh, hierarchical sets. You know, if somebody isn't well versed, they 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 can't you know hook up with a solid strength and conditioning coach. Like figuring out how to to go into a, a gym that's got like all the selectorized machines. And like you do one set, real, real lightweight, real easy, increase the weight a little bit harder, increase the weight a little bit harder. And then one final set where you really get after it, then move on to a completely different, you know, you did a press. Now you do a pull and and you do, you do a circuit of that. that takes you 15 minutes and then you, you uh, find some hot person on YouTube doing a stretching video and you do their, their stretching cool down mobility video. And, uh, and then, you know, do invest some, something in like a, a zone two cardio, you know, practice, whether it's a echo bike or, or a rower, or, you know, a combination of that stuff, my God, the, the benefits that you get from that. And it, it, it takes a little bit of discipline and effort to carve out the time for it. It's 20 to, th- it's 20 to 30 minutes. First thing in the morning, like I get up and I try to jump on, I, I have a heart rate monitor. I set on it's between 70 to 75% for at least 20 minutes. It takes me 10 minutes of pretty hard riding to get my heart rate into range. So it ends up being about 30 minutes and it's 20 minutes in the zone. And I do it first thing when I wake up, um, at least five to six, I mean, I try to do it seven. If it ends up being six, I'm okay on one day, we'll do a walk. Um, but it's a little harder for me, especially in the train to like get the heart rate up. I find I can, you know, on the assault bike, I can do a little faster or the echo bike and it pays such dividends in terms of like, you know, body fat and performance or just even being, and this is, man, this is something that two things, um, I personally, and Tex and I were doing a podcast talking about like, you know, things I've learned or more importantly, things going forward. I need something to train for. I 100% do. And I was missing it when the Jits guys showed up and I started going up and, and rolling with them. It actually gave me a little bit of model of being like, dude, uh, I need to lose some weight. Like I'm just too big. Like I need to be more mobile. So then I started dieting down and I need to have better capacity and I need to be able to do this and this. And it started kind of like fine tuning what I needed to do, which kind of gave me a little bit of a mission, but I need something to train for. And I think a lot of times for most of the people out there, it's like, well, I'd like to be, you know, 7% body fat, or I would like to be this. I feel like it's a big goal. If, well, I'm just throwing it out there. <laughs> if your goal is only one for improved physicality or, you know, how I look in the mirror, or how my Instagram pictures look, it becomes extremely vapid and it's impossible to be consistent in it. Where if you actually set a goal or you have a mark, you have something you want to do. Like a year from now, I want to be able to do X and I have to be ready. I find that you can put a pretty good plan together. And I know for me, I needed it just because I needed something to compete against. And I needed to see if what I was doing was actually benefiting me. And it's been uh, it's been a lot of fun, especially going up and doing all the fundamental stuff and then going and rolling with these high level dudes, which is really cool because they fucking smash you in seconds. And you're like, boy, didn't see that thing coming. And it's been just, I mean, like, like the beating those guys do. And what's wild is we see them in the weight room and I know what they're lifting. But then when you roll with them on the mat, it's like they all got a thousand pound squat and can fucking, you know, smash your skull with a finger. But yet, you know, like it's a really interesting deal because we're used to, you know, playing in the NFL. I know what these guys are. I know the size. I know the speed. But then understanding that these guys understand angles and positions and can observe force in weird ways. It's been really uh, eye opening and fun for me. The other piece, when you brought up uh, Greg Glassman, if Greg could have just stayed on that road, what you were talking about, about improving the community instead of trying to pick a fight with anybody, like a junkyard dog, anybody that looks at him, he could have 
stayed the course and done so much. And uh, like it, 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 it kills me every single day to see, you know, especially where CrossFit's kind of, you know, I mean, it was such a driving force and I just don't know if it has that same purpose today, but fuck man, he was onto something good. And for all his, yeah, for all his idiosyncrasies and however you feel about him, the fact that he was able to be spearheading that, to uh, you know, putting barbells people in people's hands, getting them fit, actually showing them that there has to be a measure for your fitness. It's fucking so smart. I think it was maybe 2004. It was early. It was really early. Um, and I was down in Santa Cruz hanging out and we were just talking shop and the sodium topic actually came up back then. He's like, you know, I just noticed that when people clean up their diets, they started having all these problems with lightheadedness and they, their work capacity really drops off. And if we get them around like five to eight grams of sodium a day, they're killing it. And it, at the time I was kind of like, oh yeah, that makes sense. And it, 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 even that early, I knew, or I, I suspected that the primary, that sodium was, uh, uh, a bystander in like the cardiovascular disease thing that it was the insulin resistance. It was the primary driver, but it didn't listen close enough. Like Greg had a real fucking nugget there that, that he saw early on. And, and it, it again, hat tip to the guy, like he was far more right than wrong where, when he, but he, it, it, and it's funny. He said this of Mel Sif, um, when he was critiquing Mel Sif, he, he's like, Mel, you're so right. So often that you don't know when you're wrong. And it, you know, pot kettle black on, <laughs> on that, but you, you know, uh, hat tip to him though, you know, I mean, 2004, if I had known that, uh, you know, this electrolyte story and sodium in particular was so important, like Nikki did pretty good competing in CrossFit when she did her run, but I didn't do a goddamn thing to augment her electrolytes. Like it was just kind of, you know, wherever we, we picked it up and looking back at some of the kind of adrenal fatigue type issues mm -hmm. that she ended up with. So it, it was sodium. It was inadequate sodium and her body was in a stress state trying to retain it because high work output, super clean diet, you know, she needed, she needed five, 10 grams of sodium a day and she was not getting it. No, it puts you in that deficit. No, I, I like the farther we get away from this thing, um, you know, like I think the negative interaction and all the bullshit with Greg kind of tints it, but when you kind of strip it away and you see the genius for what he did and his ability to observe things and comment on them, um, I've encountered very few people like that. So pretty yeah, sure. Absolutely. Well, people are still finding CrossFit. People are still finding fitness for the first time. People are still finding online training at powerathletehq.com for the first time. And what I want to get into, Rob, you mentioned fasting and John, you're hitting your 20 to 30 minutes in the morning fasted. That's going to be something that people try maybe failing at when they're hitting a 60 minute class or 60 minute training session for the first time. So what, how do you fast correctly to utilize the benefits in training and where can people, you know, not fuck themselves up? It's a lot to unpack. And, you know, I wrote my first, uh, published article on intermittent fasting in 2005 and it went out to exclusively like a CrossFit uh, population. And by 2006, I so regretted releasing <laughs> this thing. Um, I, I was like, fuck, can I put this genie back in the bottle? And no, you, you can't because this, this group of folks were already training right at the edge of human performance. And they were usually on the lower carb side. And then they said, you know, and what I was talking about was like maybe a, a 16 hour fast, you know, eight hour feeding window. And so being type A overachievers, these folks started oh, 16 is good. 20 is better, you know? <laughs> and when you, when you introduce yourself to a really stressful environment, the first couple of weeks you feel great because there's this evolutionary adaptation where it's like the stress hormones are pumping, adrenaline is going you know, you're, you're in a fight for your life and your body is like, okay, let's bring it. Let's, let's do this thing. But we are not designed to do that chronically. And so then six months down the road, the person will reach out to me and they're like, my hair is falling out. I have retrograde performance and I haven't had anything approximating a libido in ages. And it's like, well, what do you do? I CrossFit six days a week on my day off. I do hot yoga in a, a, you know, 80 minute ruck march with a, 
80 pound backpack. And it was like, and this was even before the sodium thing was even on the, on the deal. So John, correct me if I'm wrong, but I would, I would guess that the fasted training in the morning is just uh, an ease. Like you get up, you you hit it first thing, like, uh, it, and then you, you probably have a, a meal not long. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's pure. It, it's purely just a function of time. Uh, like on, on the days that we weight train, I end up doing a little bit of stuff in the afternoon. So, or even at night we have this, um, it's called hypermax oxygen where, uh, it's this huge bag that gets pumped full of oxygen and we'll do like, I'll do intervals with it. It takes about 12 to 15 minutes to kill it. And, uh, Tom Inkledon at Cosenta tested it and it found it extremely beneficial for reducing, you know, viruses and some of the health things. So, uh, that's what we did through COVID and to kind of keep the kids healthy. So I do that a couple of days a week um, just as a preventative measure. Um, but I did not really see any benefit between fasted and unfasted cardio. It just more as a function when I wake up, I just immediately go and do it just because I know if I don't do it first thing, I'm, it's going to, the day's going to lose out or it's going to lose out on the day. So it's not necessarily, um, you know, function, even though, uh, you know, bodybuilding dogma is like, oh, fasted cardio. When you look at all of the research it's pretty conclusive that it doesn't really matter if it's fasted or not. It just matters that you do it. And more importantly, you know, people just set a timer. We're like, oh, I'm going to do this for 20 minutes. Um, I actually do it where I want to stay within that zone two window for at least 20 minutes. And I got to ride like hell. And, the, you know, the more fit I get and the more stuff I do, the longer it takes me to get there. So then I get on and I just try to fucking ride as fast as I can get into the into the zone that I need to and then just kind of like make sure I just keep titrating it and staying right in that position. Which direction are the zones? Are we in zone one right now uh, or are we in zone five? No, we're in zone nothing. one, which is, yeah, zone one. And, you know, the, uh, most people when they walk, unless you're walking up some form of incline, but if you went to take your dog for a walk, you're, most people are in a zone one. I find it very hard to get into a zone two unless we're walking on an incline. Well, your dog's. Yeah, like they they pull Kate along. Yeah, well, she's tiny. Uh, but for most people going out, like I think that there's a real benefit, um, you know, and then you also talked about getting some sunlight in, in the morning. I mean, there's some really cool research in that idea of getting direct sunlight first thing in the morning, but getting out and just moving. I mean, so uh, ideally, I'd love to be able to go out and walk and get outside. Some days it's just like, let me get on the bike, let me get it done and, you know, whether or not. But uh, I think what's wild about the intermittent fasting um, and I'm sure Rob can speak more about the health benefits, but when you look at it purely for fat loss, it just always looked like more of a cool way to get into caloric restriction, you know, just reduce your time window. Yeah. I mean, there's no magic associated with it, but yet you turn on the TV and everybody's speaking on all this magic. I'm like, really? The magic is in calorie the reduction magic is in butter in your coffee. Right? Oh, fuck. Remember that one? Remember these people are like, I can't lose weight. I'm fasting. I'm eating a thousand calories, but you're eating 6,000 calories of fucking butter coffee. Well, it, it, in the, it was like 2003, 2004 on the CrossFit message board. I was like, try some butter in your coffee. And everybody really liked it. You're the guy? You oh, started this? He's patient zero on butter. <laughs> yeah. And then people started doing some blood work and they're like, dude, my cholesterol went to the moon. And I'm like, oh, that's maybe not a good idea. <laughs> so, well, you know, um, uh, real quick on the, the fasting. Um, the stuff that was a little bit of a hip fake for me was that there were some animal models that suggested that this intermittent fasting could have these really interesting um, health span, lifespan benefits. The thing is, though, is that to get the analogous um, fasting duration in a human for a mouse, a, a 24-hour fast for a mouth, mouse is equivalent to a week-long fast for a human. It, it's just not going to work. Like The things just don't work. And I, I did a whole big talk on... Um, uh, longevity are we trying too hard like i i think that um all the calorie restriction stuff is 99% bullshit i think the fasting stuff is 99% bullshit all of that stuff all that it is when you break it down to brass tacks and i'm very unpopular in this you know like um Rhonda Patrick who i have huge respect for but like she's super deep into this Peter Atia was deeper into this and the, over the course of time, he has gone much more the direction that I've, I've been talking about the last like five to seven years. All that fasting is, all that calorie restriction is, is an exercise mimetic. It looks like exercise, except you don't get a cardio base and you don't get jacked. It's the, the, the only thing with that. And what is never compared in these studies, what they're always comparing is a sick 
overfed population of animals with a calorie restricted set of animals. And the food that they're feeding these animals is nothing approximating a species appropriate diet. It is always like be, because they're trying to be scientific, they they have like a uh, casein protein, whey protein, corn oil and sucrose all bound together with like corn cubes so that they know exactly how much shit is there because they're they're trying to be quantifiable. That's all fine, but it's understood also that that diet itself at almost any intake level causes disease. What they never compare or rarely compare, it's only been done a couple of times, they will feed these animals an ad libitum species appropriate diet and compare that with a species appropriate diet calorie restricted. If you're feeding them a species appropriate diet and calorie restricting them, the animals die young because you're starving them to death. And then an ad libitum species appropriate diet in an environment where they're not being predated and they don't have uh, immunological challenges like basically infectious disease, the animals live almost as long as the calorie restricted animals. So like 30 years of calorie restriction, David Sinclair, Mark Matson, all these like, like icons in this space, I... All the, it, it, in my opinion, you would get better results now and later if you built a zone two cardio base and tried to build as much muscle mass as you possibly could, absent like like giant amounts of going liver yeah. king. Like I think once well, you you head into like uh, super physiological, yeah, yeah. Once you you know if you're high physiological, even with like TRT and stuff like that, I think that that's going to be fantastic. And I think there's great great reasons to support all that stuff. But literally the totality of all the hubbub around fasting, calorie restriction, life extension, I think is complete bullshit. Like it, it was it was a poor study design that has then launched us into this whole thing. And I sound like a dick saying it, but I've been I've been parroting this for probably about 10 years now. I'm like, uh -huh. I think we're on the wrong course with this. I don't think we're doing the right thing. And all the smart folks, all the folks that did the Ivy League schools, and they've got many more PhDs and MDs that I than I have who have been really balls deep in this stuff. All that I've seen them do is walk further and further away yeah. from that like calorie restriction is is the jam and this is what we need to to be doing. Um I think what we're fighting is entropy, this tendency for our systems to just become dysregulated for for error to to introduce into like our DNA coding and protein folding and all this stuff. And a little bit of fasting here and there, it's probably okay. But the main thing you just don't want to do is just don't overeat, which isn't a trivial thing to avoid in a modern hyperpalatable food environment. But if you've got something like a power athlete program where you've got some zone two cardio, you've got mobility, you've got outstanding multivariate strength training so that you're getting hypertro uh, hypertrophic stimulus, you're getting a rate of force development stimulus, you're getting a max effort stimulus, and this is in a rotating template of different planes and angles and all this type of stuff. That's as close to anti-aging medicine as we're ever going to get for, uh, until we really crack some serious codes. It, uh, uh, but, you know, like uh, Dave Asprey is saying he's going to live to 180 and, you know, he's he's doing all this stuff. And that, that guy is going to be lucky to make 70. It, 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 because he, he, he looks like a bag of bones with skin hanging off of it. Cause he doesn't have any muscle mass yeah. and I doubt he's got any real cardiovascular capacity. I mean, he used to, to brag about laying in bed, wearing an electric stim deal to get his workout. And, um, I, I, I no. Well, uh, just to jump on that electric stim stuff, the stim only works if you use it in conjunction with a strength training product or some template, like it's about cleaning up motor units, but, I mean, we've been on this for over 10 years. I mean, uh, God, it had to be plus 10 years ago when we were on this kind of constant thread uh, with Alon and um, I think it was Amy and Rob and myself. And somehow it got on all of this research on fasting. And I think after looking at it all, and I think we all came to the conclusion was like, this just looks like a fun way into calorie restriction. If you can't monitor or curtail your eating, then just close your window down. There's no magic associated with it. And we've been saying that for years and then it kind of goes away and then it comes back and then it goes away. Um, but like Rob made the best point, right? The longest determining factor for longevity is going to be muscle. And unfortunately, it's very, very hard to keep and maintain high amounts of quality muscle in extreme caloric restriction, especially in a low protein environment. 
and you need to create mitochondrial density, uh, create that zone two, lift some weights so that you're recruiting motor units, doing a little bit of hyper- uh, uh, hypertrophy work, and being consistent in your eating and avoiding excess body fat because everybody that I've looked at for all of this different blood work, body fat goes up, becomes extremely oxidative, and shit starts coming off the rails. It's amazing. The more muscle, less body fat, the margin of error really increases where now all of a sudden you don't have to be as exact, but just getting people to it. And, you know, we've seen people shed huge amounts of body fat by just incorporating some zone two 30 minutes a day and not eating like an asshole. It, uh, like it doesn't feel overly complicated. I almost think it's too easy where people are like, nah, it's gotta be bullshit. It's gotta be steroids. It's gotta be this and this. And you're like, no, it fucking works. And, uh, you know, I sleep better. I do better. I know when I don't do it because I can start feeling it here. And um, it just, it feels like everybody's looking for this magical hack that you're going to somehow work your way in the back door into this thing when it's like there's no way to avoid doing the hard work and the consistency. And, you know, like it doesn't, uh, yeah, I mean, um, I'm always glad to know when we don't check in for a little bit that all of a sudden we're like, no, we're still on the same path. It's still the same stuff. Nothing. There's no new revelations. It, it would have been super cool if, uh, you know, an 18.6 feeding window was some sort of like magically optimized spot between anabolism and catabolism. And you got some, some life enhancement uh, benefits out of it. And again, like if it is the tool that you don't overeat, then it, it, it's going to extend your life. It's going to extend health and, and lifespan most likely, but there, there just doesn't seem to be magic above and beyond that. I, I, I will say that uh, in this whole story, uh, one of the interesting benefits seems to be that some degree of ketosis, even intermittently, seems to have some legit anti-aging uh, effects, like an a animal model again, but ad libitum fed, uh, just a low-carb, uh, the cross section of of rodents, they had like a ten percent enhancement in in both uh, lifespan and health span, and then a legitimately ketogenic arm of these animals had like a fifteen percent enhancement. and And so I do think that there might be a little bit of magic around even some intermittent uh, uh, ketogenic uh, dabbling. But um, you know, the funny thing with that is if you are reasonably active, a ketogenic diet, maybe 120 to 150 grams of carbs a day. It doesn't need to be 30 grams of carbs well, a day. And also body fat. Yeah. But also, uh, yeah, uh, body fat. I mean, we saw people that were sub 10% body fat that were super active. They were eating 150 grams of carbohydrates and in ketosis. So I think that, uh, your ability, the leaner you are, you you can handle more you know, more carbohydrate. We saw that if somebody was 25, 30% body fat, we put them on a low carb diet. And then all of a sudden when they got to like 18 to 20, we put them on isocaloric. And then as they got leaner, all of a sudden now we could add in more carbohydrate and they ended up seeming to do better and we could stay in ketosis, add more carbs. So I think body fat and energy expenditure is a key factor where now all of a sudden it's like, oh, you can only eat 25. Yeah, but that's for somebody that maybe carries a ton of body fat, more oxidative stress and more poor insulin resistance. Rock and stuff. Rob, you're you're well versed in the power athlete vernacular, the atmosphere. You've been around speaking at the symposium and a guest lecturing with John at several seminars experience. Well, uh, you gotta remember there wouldn't be a power athlete or there really wouldn't even be a CrossFit football if there wasn't a Rob Wolf. And I remember when Glassman and Rob knows this and you'll remember when Glassman pitched me on this. The first person I called was Robbie as I was driving, and all I remember is, really? Nah, are you serious? Like, there's no fucking way. And I'm like, this is what he said. And Rob's like, I guess you got to do it then. Because I had reservations. Um, you know, Rob and I had been pretty forthright and, like, had seen kind of, like, Rob was my insider in terms of the circus, but with the original pitch. And I gave it to Rob verbatim. As soon as Glassman pitched me, I went and called Rob and uh, that would have been, I mean, if Rob had been like, don't do it, just go to law school. seems like a better plan, but, uh, <laughs> which, but I, I think we were young. I think we had stars in our eyes and there was this feeling like we could really invoke some change and help a ton of fucking people. And, you know, we're a part of this huge tidal wave. And like, at least that's how I felt when we were in it. And I was like, you know, uh, a lot of the bullshit that we were encountering was just part of the turbulence of being into that big wave. 
And uh, Rob's always been a, a great rock for me. So, well, and you know, it's it's funny, and again, not to to derail this thing, but I, I totally speculative, but I really think that Greg had moments of like pure altruism and really sincerely in that moment wanted to do right by the people around him. Like he saw these opportunities, he saw this uh, amazing talent and and uh, kind of perspective that you brought to bear on this thing. But then he would go away and he would stew. And for some reason he would then, it, it you know, I love being around peers who are better at me than a variety of things. I, I like to think that I can, you, you know, kind of hang with them, whether it's going out on the, on the shooting range or doing archery or jits or you, you know, whatever, like uh, just be able to hang. And sometimes I'm a absolute raw beginner with this stuff and, and that's fine. But Greg would go away and then start second guessing, um, surrounding himself with really solid, competent people, which is where my really came in because he, he made this this offer with no strings attached, and it was this really great opportunity, which it was awesome that you ran with it. And then instead of just being comfortable with the reality that he would be surrounded with really competent go-getters uh, that may not always agree with him, but that al- always had his back so long as he wasn't a prick to them, he he would then start creating this this uh, drama fest, you know, and and uh, trying to nuke the the success of of whatever that that process was and that that's why it's so so weird it's such a, it's a you know i'm sure some uh psychologist who if you could piece together enough of the story could could explain a lot of it but i i really think in the moment he legitimately wanted to see good things happen with good people but then he would get a little bit of of distance from it and he would start second guessing it and kind of get paranoid and freaked out and then scuttle the whole thing. Yeah. Well, well versed in the the one liners, don't be weird. Move the dirt, be the hammer. And I mean, Element's got some excellent elements as well, right? This ball this box is salty as fuck that's written on the package that you <laughs> send out, uh, which is awesome. Uh, but what I want is get your opinion about the phrase move the dirt. What does move the dirt mean to you? You just got to get the work done. You know, you, you, it doesn't matter what it is. And this is w- one of these things where being involved with something like power athlete is so valuable because yeah, it's great to be in good shape. It's good to be jacked and, you know, be athletic and everything. But if it doesn't make you better at the rest of your life, w- w- what's it for? You know, like we we have very limited time, and if you don't come away from your experience, and it, it's so cool that John has this like rhetoric and philosophy background because he's always <laughs> tinkering with this this shit in in this regard. But this is where it's um it's a time efficient process hanging with you guys because move the dirt if you really internalize that. It's just like whatever the task is in front of you, you just do it. And, and you, you, you know, there's the pile start, don't stop till it's done, you know, and, and, uh, and then there's the next pile and you keep going. And it, this is stuff that, you know, having kids trying to instill in my kids, like they, if, if I could reach inside their minds and let them know how fucking amazing they are and how much they could do, then my job as a parent is done. Yeah. Because then they're unfettered from everything, you know. It's like there's nothing they can't tackle. There's nothing they can't do. And it, it sounds a little, you know, goofy, but um, that that move the dirt, the dirt thing is it, like too few people recognize that just hard work is how it all happens. Whether it's building a business, having a good marriage, having a relationship with your kids, you know, you may not be feeling great that day, your food may be off point, you know, there's all these different things that you could make the argument that like this moment isn't the moment to do this thing. And it's like, no, fuck it, just get in and go and and do it. And uh, uh, so that's what move the dirt means for me. And it, it's why I love you guys because the, you know, like be the hammer, move the dirt, like this stuff on uh, it, it's uh, it's multidimensional in what it's getting across. There's like that, that locker room towel snap element to it. That's just kind of like funny and, and, um, you know, surface, but there's all this deeper shit to it, you know? 
and and uh, it's just awesome. And if folks are are open to experiencing that or thinking about it on this this uh, deeper levels, like it's really valuable. Awesome. Thank what are you, you. what are you digging towards for twenty twenty three? 2023, I'm, I'm just still further kind of streamlining my life. Like we, we put the healthy rebellion into a manageable, like kind of stasis mode and I'm still stewarding that thing. But, um, you know, something that element as a company has, has tinkered with for the last two, two and a half years is this three on one off sprint rest model, uh, in which people, um, we, we do these OKRs where we have expectations for everybody on the team and what, what our goals are. And if we need help, get help and all that stuff. But you work like a motherfucker for three weeks and then you're offline for three weeks. And I mean like offline, like you, you are checked out, you're done, you're still getting paid. But it, you know, when you, when you look at, um, you know, efficiency within kind of the corporate workspace, it 90% of the time is just shuffling shit around. You know, it's not really doing anything meaningful. We kind of see this a little bit with, uh, particularly in the pandemic where um, people were like 20, 25% more productive working from home and typically spent less time working, but then they go crazy because they don't have a community to interact with. And it's just Groundhog's Day and all the, the same stuff. But you can't both sprint and marathon at the same time. And running a business is a little bit of both. And so, what we try to do is run the marathon in sprints with a, a lot of downtime and kind of walking in between. And I, I've been an entrepreneur. I've been, I, I haven't made a dime from somebody else in 23, almost 25 years. It's kind of weird. Like I, 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 you know, I, I, uh, yeah, it's just odd actually to, to think about. And it's really easy to just always say, well, I've got this other thing. I've got this other thing and to not draw these, these compartmentalized, you know, boundaries around this stuff. It's very easy to do that in a startup as well. But, um, James, our, our CEO had a really fascinating insight on this where, you know, thinking about this work rest kind of cycling that, that we could do. And so this is something I'm trying to, to get into my own life. Like Nikki and I have sat down and we've blocked out these, these periods of time and within element and the other work related things that I have, I have these very specific goals that I need to meet my OKR type stuff. And then we're going to have these week blocks where we'll go down and hang out with the wellborns for a week and go to Texas and we'll do this and we'll do that. And I, I think that it's one of these ways to really stay fresh. Like I can work really hard on something for a chunk of time and then burnout starts setting in. But if you've got, if you know that the end is in sight, you can keep grinding. You can sure. you can keep doing it, and then you really just one hundred percent unplug, and then you know recharge, get some different perspectives, do some fun stuff that isn't the usual grind, and then you plug back in. And so for twenty twenty three, that's really something I'm working on is how to do that that uh, uh, three on one off you know work rest cycle and see how it works in my life, see how it works for the the kind of uh, business and advisory obligations that that I have, but I'm really excited about it. And it makes a lot of sense. It, it's, um, it's a lot more natural. I, I think uh, if we're thinking about, you know, kind of hunter gatherer type things, like you can imagine some, some peaks and troughs and those, uh, the sprints can be fun too. Like when you're, you're in the intensity, you know, you're doing something really intense and you have some, some big goals that you're trying to get after, that can be really fun, but I what one thing I find is it particularly as we get older and you get more obligations, you have kids, all that type of stuff. I'm a little less likely to take things on because my my plate can be too full. But also, it's just that grind. It's like I can't just do the the year long grind on something. I need to partition things and break break things up. But what was interesting is when Nikki and I sat down and really started blocking out. The, okay, we'll be online these points, and then we'll be traveling or doing stuff on on these other, uh, you know, rest and assess periods. What I ended up doing was making these lists of the shit that I wanted to do during the sprint. Like I actually added stuff to it, and and so it, it at the same time that I'm trying to pare some stuff out of my life, like oh, there were some some things that I'm like, oh, you know, I could do this and I could do that in these sprints. Because I know I'm going to have this rest period. You know, it's it's funny when we moved to Texas, we helped my friend Michael open a straight blast gym there in New Brunfels. 
it, but like Nikki and I didn't do jits for seven or eight months. Like we trained together maybe like twice and then Michael got the gym open and it was literally, um, into February, beginning of March that he opened the gym and then COVID hit. And so mm-hmm. then we were, we were closed for, I don't know, two and a half, three months. And then we started getting in and, and training. And then, um, when we decided that we were, we were going to, uh, leave Texas, uh, we were in so much, um, you know, focus trying to find somewhere else to land that we trained very, very little in the the exit period, like that last seven months leaving. So I, I got my, my, uh, brown belt from John Frankel and, uh, there in Texas, but then my training was just super spotty, like very hit and miss. And I landed up here in, um, uh, Montana. And so headquarters for straight blast gym is in Portland. Uh, but the, the main heart, uh, arguably of, of straight blast gym is here in Montana. There's like five gyms throughout the greater Montana area. There's three of them in Kalispell alone, which is only like a 30,000 person city, you know, between, and then it's about a hundred thousand people between Kalispell, Whitefish and, and Big Fork where the three gyms are. But the Kalispell gym has like 600 members wow. at Whitefish gym, like 300, like it's super successful because they run these things in a a really great way. But like yesterday's class, there were seven black belts on the mat. There were about eight brown belts, five or six purple belts, and then a, a pretty good uh, uh, cadre of white belts. But um, when I arrived here, I landed amidst a group of people that had been training really consistently for a long time. And I was like, fuck, I am not, I, I got my brown belt, but I am not at this level. Like it was kind of conspicuous for a while, at least for me. So I'm just now kind of feeling like I've grown into the brown belt. Like I, I, I feel good. Um, I, I am not a submission samurai, but John, I, I did, uh, largely what, what you described near the end of my blue belt entering into my purple belt, which was, uh, I just get into the shittiest positions people could get, like get on my back, get a rear naked choke, get it, 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 it sunk just, just shy of finishing it. And then I would get out of it and, and I've gotten to where I'm pretty hard to put away. Like folks will get me, but like, they got to really work to, to put me away. And now I'm, I'm circling back around and like, I'm trying to be the hammer now. Like I'm trying to, to, to shore up that submission side of the, 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 you know, the other part of, of jits, but on that, like survive and escape thing, I'm pretty good. Like I'm, I'm slippery and I'm hard to hard to put in the bag at this point. But when I first arrived here in Kalispell, man, it, it was, uh, you never want, it never feels good when you're at, at a rank or, or something, or like, it, you know, somebody has an expectation of like your athletic prowess or whatever. And it's kind of like the fuck's up with that guy. And I, I was that <laughs> guy for a while. So that, that, that sucked. That, that wasn't comfortable, but I recognized, you know, what the, what the mechanisms were in it. And, and, uh, and, um, avoiding the gym, funny enough, wasn't going to fix it. So I just had to like commit and I got fucking smashed and humiliated a lot. And, and now I'm, I'm much, much better. Now you, you have to go, I mean, you have way more experience in this than I do, but it's funny the, uh, to my class, a bunch of like higher ranked, you know, black and color belts will show up to my class. And it's funny, you know, after they go through like the teaching that's work on this, always like go touch me. And I'm like, you know, because uh, they always want to wrestle with the bigger dude. So there's a there's a big dude, Pe- uh, Pedro, who's a black belt, and he always shows up and he's like, he sees me. I'm like, what's up? He's like, oh, I came for a little bit, and uh, he's big. He's probably like six one, probably three twenty, three thirty, and he will get me inside control and just fucking smash my ribs, and it's so good for me. And uh, to the point where like, you know, uh, but then I can kind of like hit my um, what I call my. Uh, Shandy's funny. He, uh, he's like, it's like a video game. You have this button, which gives you superpowers. So he's like, stop using your superpowers to get out of shit. He's like, just fucking do the technique. Stop trying to like, you know, cause I'll like shoot out real fast or try to like, you know, overarm or basically do shit like, you know, like to make it. So he's like, just suffer in the positions and like actually use the technique. So it's been really humbling for me, but fuck man, he was laying on my ribs. And, uh, uh, so then I was wrestling with this, with this blue belt last night and I got him in the same position and I just fucking got up on my toes and I put my rib cage on him and was just fucking smashing the life out of him. And I just waited until he was really tired and I could hear him holding his breath and trying to fight it and then just fucking slithered in and got him. And I, I think what it's teaching me is patience 
And, you know, it's, it's just really good. But yeah, I mean, for anybody, I'm like, and I even tell, like we were doing some like, you know, passing guard stuff. I let the guy, like he had my sleeve, he had my collar. He basically had both of his feet on my hips. Uh, and he was basically extended like in a spider guard. And I was like, is this your best? Do you feel like you're in your best position? Is this the one you want me on? Is this where you want, you know? And the guy's like, yeah. I'm like, all right, now we go. And even after he's like, fuck dude, I bet nobody talked to me like that. I'm like, well, fuck, I want you to put in the best position because I'm not going to get better if I just am constantly fighting for position from the beginning. I got to wait until they get me in a bad one and then fight their way out, which actually I heard, um, uh, Danifer talk about that they do for Gordon Ryan. Then also I heard, uh, Hodger Gracie talk about that of like, if you want to get good, you know, let the guy get you in the best position and then learn to fight out of it. And I was like, well, fuck dude, that's, that's what I'm going to do. So it's been, it's been a lot of fun. Um, and then just, you know, there's some inherent, you know, obviously playing in the NFL and training and all the stuff I've done, there's just some inherent understanding of balance and like movement. And, but then also realizing I don't like to be on my back. Like that's a huge one for me. So like having to like sit on my back and be in these positions, almost like a submissive position. It's uh, it's, it's been really good for me. It's been super humbling. That's awesome. Well, there's always, you know, turn on knees and turtle and wrestling out of that and everything. Like uh, it'll, it'll be interesting to see how your, your game develops. Like uh, uh, the, the interesting thing about jujitsu is, is that it, clearly size matters strength matters attributes matter and all that stuff but if you if you really lean into that technical side you can keep getting better even as you get older even as you get weaker even as you you know you have less cardio and and everything um size and strength and all that stuff matter but you know wearing a 160 pound backpack like if you got a 160 180 pound you know really good black belt that, that you are going with specifically That'll still knacker you. Like yeah. if the guy knows what he's doing and he's able to to anticipate what you're doing, and and I I love the uh, the funneling where you can um, you can take a situation where there's like infinite variables, and then you can start refining it down so that the, the person's only got two or three options, you know, yeah. and that's where it starts looking like you can mind read and stuff like that because it it. Uh, uh, you, you limit the options and you're just kind of wearing the person down. That is where like the, the smaller, less attribute, uh, gifted individual can do really well at jits, but it's also where it, it, and this is where you're, you're pretty unique. And, you know, we have, we have friends like Andy and Dave and, and stuff like that, that come out of the, the seal community that they just learn how to learn and learning how to learn it, it most fundamentally is being cool with being the, the dog shittiest person on day one and like, just bring it. I don't care how bad I suck, but you, you know, expose me to it. And then you get a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. And you don't try to hide the weaknesses. You actually go deep into it. And then all of a sudden your weaknesses are your strengths. Like if you're impossible to put away because you have great position, great posture, like one of, one of my favorite coaches, John Frankel, he says that posture will solve between 51 and 99% of all your problems you know, in, in jujitsu and most of the the stuff that you end up getting screwed up with, it's because your posture broke down. doesn't matter how old you are. You can fix your posture, you know, it, it, and that's like arm awareness, limb awareness, where you're putting pressure on the mat and all that type of stuff. And it's cool because if you develop a non-attribute based game, as you age, you don't need to pull the transmission out of that game every five years as you you lose a cylinder, you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, it, it can always keep keep getting better. Yeah, the uh, uh, Sala Ribeiro, who's uh, Shanji's brother, wrote a book, um, University Jiu Jitsu, and in the book he talked about white belt is like the uh, the belt of survival, like the thing that you learn as a white belt is how to survive. And instead of worrying about submissions and this and all this other jiggy shit, just like focus on how to survive in every position. And that was extremely. Uh, liberating for me where I was like, all right, I don't have to worry about anything else. I just need to roll with these dudes and like not get submitted. And then I just got to the point where I was like, all right, let me get these guys into submission. Now I can, I, I fight my way out. But uh, that's been really a lot of fun, but um, it's true. I mean, the, uh, the, the other one that struck me is when I rolled with guys that are good, um, all of a sudden, like I'm soaked, like sweating and I'm looking and they don't even have like a bead of sweat on their lip. 
they are like so cool. Kind of like, like, why are you working this hard? And the thing I constantly get into, I'm like, fuck, dude, I've been battling these guys and they're not even tired. Like they're so efficient and there's no wasted movement and it's so slow and this and like, you know, there's no explosive dynamic. It's just very smooth and transition in this. And I'm like, fuck, I'm working way too hard. It's too herky jerky. I need to relax. And that's where uh, Shanji's like, uh, stop using your fucking superpower. Just play the fucking game, you know? And in typical Brazilian fashion, but it's um, it's been good for me to have a new challenge, something to also the noodle on. But uh, it's just it's also really just opened my eyes up to the fact that people, if they're going to do this stuff, need more to be more durable. And I, I dude, I love the straight blast stuff. Um, I was creeping on the website and kind of going through it, and I love the fact that it's a gym. I mean, they do jits, but there's Muay Thai and there's training. Like they're trying to incorporate this holistic more so than just like show up and roll, you know, which maybe be more Brazilian in a way. But the idea of putting some modalities together, you know, a little bit of conditioning, a little bit of weights. Like I was looking at the different gyms and I was amazed. It feels like Montana's the hub for it all. And just seeing the pictures of the classes. I mean, there's hundreds of people at these things and realizing that it's just about good training partners. Like I know when I show up to class and I have good training partners it really is helpful because I always try to roll with people better than me. I'm like, dude, I, uh, even if I get submitted, I'll always be like, how'd you get there? Like, I know where this point was, what were you working for? And, uh, it's just been a lot of fun in terms of just learning a new skill and then, uh, having a white belt, which means that I have basically license to suck. I'm like, you know what this belt means? Nobody expects anything from me and I'm supposed to be dog shit. I'm totally fine with it. The minute that I get some stripes or colors around my world, now all of a sudden people are going to expect me to do shit. I'm like, I like to stay this color forever. Yeah, it's funny. Folks get into this uh, uh, thing of wanting to advance, but man, sandbag as long as you can. <laughs> like, it's, it's, where, it's where the money is, man. Yeah. Well, Fly under the radar, sandbag. Well, that's another episode of Power Athlete Radio. And Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Bye. Bye. This episode of Power Athlete Radio is powered by Train Heroic, the most immersive strength training app experience on the market. We've built our online training business by partnering with Train Heroic and helping us deliver all of our world-class training programs like Jack Street, Field Strong, and Grindstone. To learn which Power Athlete training program best suits your goals, head to powerathletehq.com slash training. And if you're a coach looking to build a business with the best tech and training, go to trainheroic.co forward slash powerathletehq.